Hi everyone. Today we are going to learn on patent doctor's articles of prematurity. To treat or not to treat. If we want to treat, when do we treat it? And how do we treat it? So I am Dr. Srinivas Murki from Paramita Chilam Hospital, Kothapet, Hyderabad. The objectives of today's presentation are to know what is patent ductus arteriosus, what are the hemodynamic consequences, what are the clinical signs and symptoms of PDA, the clinical morbidity associations of PDA, how do we evaluate PDA from the echocardiography, and then we look at what is the current evidence on treatment of PDA, why there is so much of controversy, and where the controversy is. Then we'll try to evolve some current approach on treatment of PDA. And once we decide to treat, we'll also look at how do we treat PDA. So PDA or patent ductus arteriosus is a small connection between the iota and the pulmonary artery. Immediately after the birth, as the pulmonary pressure falls, the duct allows the blood from the iota to flow into the pulmonary artery. There is a rise in systemic perfusion or systemic vascular resistance because of the clamping of the cord. And there is a fall in pulmonary artery pressure because of the opening of the lungs immediately after birth. This facilitates the shunt from left to right from the iota to the pulmonary artery. Now, normally, this reversal of flow will cause period to close. And also the high oxygen concentration of blood coming into the iota will make the duct close. And that's what happens in term babies. Most of the duct closes by 24 to 48 hours. But in preterm, because of the peculiar characteristics of the preterm duct, the duct remains open. And the more premature, more likely that the duct will remain open. So what will happen if the duct is open? There will be increased blood flow into the pulmonary artery. So there will be pulmonary overcirculation, and there will be a shunt of blood from the iota to the pulmonary artery. That may lead to ductal steel and systemic hypoperfusion. So the clinical symptoms are related to both pulmonary overcirculation and systemic underperfusion or hypoperfusion. Now the clinical symptoms will also depend and would be dependent on the magnitude of the duct, that is a duct size, systemic vascular resistance, pulmonary vascular resistance, this determines the flow across the duct. And if there is increased flow, how the immature myocardium is able to adopt to the increased blood flow to the left heart and the left atrium and left ventricle. So whenever there is pulmonary overcirculation and systemic hypoperfusion, the degree and severity of these would determine what type of clinical features you see in the preterm baby. Now, the clinical effects of PDA are mostly these. There could be a murmur, mostly because of the flow across the duct. Because of systemic hypoperfusion, you could see systemic hypotension. There could be evidence of end organ dysfunction because of the decreased flow in the iota. There could be feed intolerance, NEC, renal dysfunction, azotemia. And because of the ductal steel into the middle cerebral artery, there could be fluctuating blood pressures and that could lead to intraventricular hemorrhage. Hypoxia or hypoperfusion to the systemic circulation may also result in lactic and lactic acidosis and metabolic acidosis. Now, pulmonary overcirculation could lead to congestion of the lungs. That could lead to increased oxygen requirement, increased ventilator requirement if the baby is on the ventilation. And there could be, when the blood flow to the lung improves, increases, there is increased blood flow to the left side of the heart, and that could lead to cardiomegaly. And in severe stages, it may even lead to pulmonary hemorrhage and pulmonary edema. Now, all these hemodynamic effects also will lead to clinical features or clinical symptoms like systemic hypotension or hypoperfusion. That will lead to risk of IVH in the brain and decrease iotic blood flow could lead to problems such as necrotizing enterocolitis and renal failure. 
pulmonary overcirculation could lead to problems such as pulmonary edema, increased need for respiratory support, pulmonary hypertension. But clinically, it could translate into increased BPD, increased ventilator requirement, increased oxygen requirement, and rarely pulmonary hemorrhage too. There is good evidence to say that a large PDA on the day three in preterm babies less than 28 weeks is associated with death or neuromorbidity by an odds of 3.4. Increased risk of IVH by an odds of 4.2 and increased risk of BPD by an odds of 3.7. We all know that large PD is often associated with NEC2. Now, once we see in the hemodynamics and the clinical features and the clinical associations, it's important to know how do we assess the PD on the echo or echocardiography. It can be broadly divided into four categories in the echo assessment. The first is to see whether the duct is patent or not. Second is, that means whether there is blood flow across the duct or not. And next is to see how is the flow pattern, whether it is left to right, right to left, or bidirectional, and see how severe is the flow. Whether it's a mild to moderate or severe flow. And this can be determined from the Doppler characteristics. Then we can also look at features of systemic hypoperfusion such as the diastolic steel seen in the descending iota or the less, less low SVC flow, meaning blood flow to the brain is reduced. We can also assess the signs of volume or pressure overload of the heart by looking at the E by A ratio of the mitral wall and some volumetric assessments. We'll discuss this in the subsequent slides. Now, the ductal characteristics that are seen on the echocardiography are the ductal size, the shunt direction or the on the color flow of the Doppler and the Doppler flow pattern across the ductus arteriosus. The Doppler flow pattern across the duct is a very useful finding to see whether it's a mild, moderate or a severe duct. Pulmonary overcirculation, you look at volume overloading of the left heart, that is enlarged LA, LV, LAA by AO ratios, increased LPA diastolic velocities, Increase E by ratios of the mitral wall and increase left ventricular uh, output is what we can see to see overload of the pulmonary circulation. Now, one can assess the systemic hypoperfusion by looking at, by looking at the postductal aortic blood flow pattern and also Doppler assessment of blood flow in the celiac artery, mesenteric artery, anterior cerebral artery, middle cerebral artery, and the SPC flows. So, these are the different parameters one looks for to see whether the duct is patent or not, whether there is pulmonary overcirculation, and whether there is systemic underperfusion or not. Now, regarding the Doppler of the duct, one thing we need to remember is increased velocity in the duct means reduced flow. Low velocity, increased flow. Increased velocity, low flows. So you can see in the first photographs here that the peak velocity is more than two meters per second. This is a closing pattern, less flows. You can see there is a flow across the duct, both during systole and diastole, there is a continuous flow. When you look at the increased flows, the velocity is decreased from 1.5 to 2 meters per second. And you can see that there is peak velocity during the systole, but the velocity decreases during diastole. Now, when the duct is severe or the flow pattern is huge, the peak velocity decreases. And you get a pulsatile pattern where you get a very high peak velocity and a very low systolic, a diastolic peak velocity. But overall, the velocities are going to be less than 1.5 meter per second. So these are very good and easy methods of assessing the duct size, mild, moderate, and severe, or the flow across the duct as mild, moderate, and severe. What we can do to the look at the pulmonary artery overcirculation is LA by AO ratio left uh, aortic root rate aortic root to the left atrial ratio will help us assess the overload of the left atrium we can look at the overload of the left ventricle by looking at the e by a ratio of the mitral wall so these are the different parameters one uses to grade the duct into mild moderate and severe we use la by av la by lv ratios la by ao ratios you can use E by A ratios of the mitral wall. You can use uh, IVRT in seconds, that is the relaxation time. 
and we can also look at the left ventricular outflows in ml per kg per minute so increase left ventricular output means the duct is large reduced rt relaxation time means more duct size increase e by ratio more severe is the duct increase la ratio more severe is the duct now systemic hypoperfusion can be seen on the descending aorta so you can see here that during systole there is a forward flow in the aorta and during diastole there is a reverse flow there is a ductal steam the blood flow is not going forward into the aorta during diastole but it's going into the pulmonary artery through the duct and that's why there is a ductal steam ductal steam is a feature of moderate to severe pda you can also see the steel of the duct in the anterior cerebral artery uh, as seen here during diastole there is a reversal flow so whether it is in the mca whether it is in the aca or in the celiac if there is a reversal of flow it is a feature of moderate to severe duct that means there is a significant systemic hypoperfusion you could also see, see clinical signs like feed intolerance nec oliguria azotemia and renal failure subsequently so those are the clinical features of duct so we know that duct matters we know that duct could lead to systemic signs and pulmonary signs we also know that we can assess the duct the severity of the duct from the echocardiogram now once we know how to assess the duct how do we know the severity then we need to know whether we treat it or not and this is the current evidence of treatment so whether you do medical or surgical treatment of the duct that is using medicines or closure of the surgical closure of the duct you will definitely require when you do medical treatment you will definitely reduce the need for subsequent ligations the medical treatment will definitely help in closure of the ducts so but when the duct decreases you would expect that the morbidity associated with the duct should reduce but unfortunately in the evidence whatever we have so far there is no change in the immediate outcome such as death bpd rop or nec medical or surgical treatment of duct did not result in decreased death bpd rop or nec also although the duct closed got closed with medical or surgical treatment there was no change in the long term outcome there was no difference in the neuro morbidities so this is very confusing that if duct is associated with the morbidities if you close the duct the morbidities do not decrease and the long term outcome do not change so why does it happen so the problem for this is because in the evidence what we have whatever we have seen so far in the all the randomized control trials we have seen that 50% of the patients in the control group also received medical treatment that means we are we are just comparing 100% treatment versus 50% treatment and that means 50% of babies in the control group always got medical treatment and this was off the trial so that means we are just comparing one group getting late treatment versus other group getting early treatment so we are not really comparing no treatment versus treatment we are just comparing early versus late treatment of medical treatment of duct also it could be quite possible that the adverse effect of ducts especially bruf and ibuprofen indomethacin could nullify the beneficial effects of duct closures so use medicine to close duct duct closes but the medicine themselves could cause harms and lead to equifying uh, equalizing the morbidities and the long term outcomes the last reason could be that pda is just an innocent bystander you close the pda but the problem which led to the pda and the morbidities is different and probably that problem could be related to infection or inflammation so we are looking uh, an innocent bystander we are treating an innocent bystander and not really treating the cause when we are treating the duct so our aim should be to treat the inflammation or infection rather than treating the duct so these are the reasons why people felt that in clinical trials we were not able to show clinical benefits of closing the duct so but however we know that duct is often associated with problems and you can see here that uh, this graph on the x axis you see the days when the duct gets closed and on the y axis you see the what proportion of the duct closes on what day so you can see here that if you look at the less than 750 gram babies at 50 days after birth still 50% of the ducts came in open so even after 50 days the ducts are remain open in children less than 750 grams and if you look at the babies between 750 to 1000 grams even at 20 days nearly 50% of the ducts are open so these ducts which are open for such a long time 
what hemodynamic cons consequences they would have on the small premature babies without treatment is still an area which needs more research. So based on the current evidence, based on the hemodynamic consequences, based on the associated clinical features, the current management strategies or current approach is that we know one thing sure that when not to treat a duct. We cannot treat a duct if a duct is a duct uh, if the if there is a duct dependent circulation, duct dependent heart disease, like a coctation of iota, or there is a TGA. So something a duct duct is there, but duct dependent lesion is there. Obviously, we should not treat drug with any uh, duct with any medical or surgical management, and we should not treat the duct if there is a right to left shunt or if there is a bidirectional shunt. Here, the duct is actually working as a vent off and it is decreasing the pressure on the right side of the heart and it's preventing the right heart failure. We should also not be treating a drug which is just a left to right shunt. Babies are asymptomatic and in the echo wise, it's only a mild PDA and not a moderate to severe PDA. So these drugs need not be treated. So we definitely know when not to treat. So which drug we may treat? So these are some of the current approaches we may vary, we may differ, but this is something which we practice. So although there is no evidence, but may be helpful, we treat these babies whenever uh, we have these problems. In a preterm baby, we treat the duct. The baby is more than one week of age. The baby is on ventilator and oxygen report, uh, support, and he has cardiac failure or pulmonary edema. That means there is definitely pulmonary overcirculation or systemic hypoperfusion. That is, he has MEC, azotemia, or oliguria. And on the ECO, we see a hemodynamically significant PDA. So more than one week of age, a ventilated baby having clinical symptoms of PDA, that is systemic hypoperfusion symptoms or pulmonary overcirculation, and it's a large duct, then there may be a role for treatment with any one of the medical treatments. So a baby less than one, month, one week of age, but more than 72 hours of, hours of life, but the baby should be less than 28 weeks. These babies we may treat if the baby has respiratory distress syndrome and baby is on the respiratory support that is on a non-invasive or invasive respiratory support and baby has definitely a PDA which is left to right shunt and there is HSPDA on the functional echo, moderate to severe duct on the functional echo, whether it could be uh, on this pulmonary circulation features or the systemic hypoperfusion features or on the Doppler of the duct. So if you have a moderate to severe duct and or there could be clinical symptoms of systemic hypo or hyperperfusion, this we cause an early symptomatic treatment. If you treat after seven days, we'll call it as late symptomatic treatment and we do that only for babies on ventilator and having moderate to severe uh, eco features and having clinical signs of systemic hypo or hypo, systemic hypoperfusion or pulmonary overcirculation. Less than one week, more than 72 hours, we call it as early symptomatic treatment and this we do only for babies less than 28 weeks. On respiratory support, having a left to right duct and echo is showing moderate to severe duct and baby also has pulmonary and systemic circulation. He may or may not have. Here, either you have moderate to severe duct on the echo or you could have clinical features of um, a moderate duct and clinical features of uh, hypoperfusion or pulmonary edema. So this is early symptomatic treatment. There is another treatment called, we treat it in less than 72 hours and less than 28 weeks. And this is called early targeted treatment. And this is done extremely small babies only. Here, the duct should be patent. The duct should have only left to right shunt. And the duct diameter should be more than 1.6 mm or LA ratio should be more than 1.5 mm. Here we are talking of some parameters which will help us to know that these ducts are likely to become hemodynamically significant PDAs. These like ducts are likely to cause pulmonary overcirculation or system hypoperfusion later on. That means we know that these duct diameter and this LA ratio is a predictor of hemodynamic significant PDA later on. So they are not having clinical symptoms now, but we are still treating these drugs because they are in extremely preterm babies and we have some parameters to say that these babies are likely to develop into a hemodynamically significant PDA. So we know when to not treat. We know what about late symptomatic treatment after one week. 
early symptomatic treatment between three and seven days. That is done only for extreme preterm babies. And less than 72 hours, we treat duct if it is showing a large duct or increased LO ratio. So if you decide to treat, or if you decide to treat some of these babies, all babies definitely needs conservative treatment. That means we should ensure that there is no fluid overload or dehydration. We should ensure that there is adequate PEEP to open the lungs. And we should be working on slightly higher PCO2s and lower PAO2s to avoid overventilation. And we should ensure that the period is adequate. We should use appropriate inotropes and vasopressors as per the assessment of cardiac function SVR and uh, fluid assessment from the IVC collapsibility. We should try to maintain the hematocrit between 35 or more than 35 or more than 40% in these babies. And if there is hyponatremia, we need to correct it and ensure that fluid balance is maintained. Always try to treat the infections because infections could be leading to both PDA as well as clinical associations of PDA. So once you do the conservative treatment in some of these babies, you may have to close the PDA by medical. All the conditions we have already talked about that. And if you decide to do medical treatment, we can do either of the three. That is, we can use indomethacin, ibuprofen or paracetamol. All three are equally efficacious, again, from the current evidence. However, each one of them is associated with some or the other side effects, like indomethacin associated with renal failure, NEC and platelet dysfunction. So we should be careful about the renal function and gut functions when you're giving indomethacin. Ibuprofen could be associated with PPH and an increased need for INO. So we should be careful in babies who have significant lung disease not to use ibuprofen. And there are some one study which shows that oral, pref oral ibuprofen is preferred over IV. And that's probably because of the slower absorption and longer duration of action of the drug. We have many trials from India where paracetamol has been shown to be equally efficacious and also as a safer method of treatment of drug. But however, when we use paracetamol, we have to give the drug four times a day for five days. That means we are trying to handle the baby much more frequently and more long, uh, for longer duration. So if you decide to give endometrisin, the dose is 0.2 milligram per kg 12 hourly for three doses or 0.1 milligram per kg once daily for five days. If you're using ibuprofen, the dose is 10 mg per kg loading followed by 5 mg per kg for next three days. If you're using paracetamol, the dose is 15 mg per kg four times a day for five days. So whenever we start treatment, we should continue to monitor the duct size, the duct flows to ensure that whether the duct size and the flows are decreasing. So if the duct size is decreased or if the flows are coming down, if from a moderate to severe, you come to mild duct and if the duct started closing, then you should stop the treatment immediately so that you can decrease the duration of this medication and the side effects related to the medication. Now coming to the last part, that is the surgical closure of the patent ductus arteriosus. We have two methods. One is open surgery, other is a device closure. Device closures can be, these days can be done in babies as uh, small as 700 grams and babies after three, first to three days after birth. And we know that surgical closure is mainly restricted to babies who have refractive PDA and that's not amenable to more than two courses of medical therapy. However, surgery has its own problems. Surgery, open surgery could be associated with diaphragmatic paresis, chylothorax, and immediately after the surgery, the baby could be having very high blood pressures. This could lead to PVH, and then some of these babies could also lead to PVL. So just to summarize, PDA is the commonest cardiac emergency in the newborn, more so in the preterm baby. The more preterm, the more likely that the baby has a large drug, and more likely that baby will have more hemodynamic consequences and more likely that this PDA could be causing problems. The clinical features are mostly related to pulmonary overcirculation and systemic hypoperfusion. And this could lead to the clinical morbidities such as pulmonary edema, pulmonary hemorrhage, increased ventilator requirements, BPD, NEC, azotemia, renal failure, IVH, and in some babies, death too. However, we know that closure is not associated with improved clinical outcomes and long-term outcomes. Based on this, we can have a compromised approach where we definitely know when not to treat, but when to treat is definitely not clear. And here we can have three policies, late symptomatic treatment after seven days, early symptomatic treatment from three to seven days, and early targeted treatment less than three days. Early targeted treatment only for babies less than 28 weeks, having a duct which is likely to develop into HSPDA, Early symptomatic treatment only for babies 
extreme preterm babies who have a left to right duct moderate to severe duct or where the duct is moderate but there are signs of systemic hypoperfusion or pulmonary overcirculation and more than one week we will treat duct only if it is a moderate to severe duct and if there is signs of systemic hypoperfusion or pulmonary overcirculation if you divide to treat if you decide to treat all babies need conservative treatment but some babies may need medical treatment and we know that all medicines are equally efficacious but have different adverse profile so when we use this medicine we have to be careful about the but knowing the adverse profile of each one of these medications thank you